Okay, hello again, and let us re let us return to where we left off from Freud last time. Last time we had just finished talking about the different stages of Freudian development, the oral, anal, phallic, latency, and genital. And what I want to do now is to talk about how those five phases of development fit in with Freud's kind of three-part, if you hear kind of like Freud's structural theory. The structural theory is his theory of the structure or the kind of imagined physical makeup of our personality. And these words have permeated certainly far beyond the language of just people in the professions to where common folks talk about it, ego and superego, kind of showing that Freud's influence has really kind of been, been huge on life in general. The id, as Freud sees it, and Freud kind of sees the human being as an energy force. And when you read about the psychodynamic theories, the idea of dynamic is that there's all this energy inside of us. Again, he was a physician, and he saw us as being this energy model, and we had all of this energy within us, and we just had to do something with that energy. So where was it going to go to, and how are we going to affect it was one of his terms, like where, where would we channel it, where would we focus it? And there was, it, it's in constant state of flux, which is dynamic, which is changing. So he talked about when we're born, we all have this id, which he sometimes calls a seething cauldron of energy, which I just love that phrase. But the id is our desires. It is our wants. It's our wishes. It's our energy life force. And Freud had a period of his life where he was talking about life forces. And if you read the term eros, E-R-O-S, that's the life force, and then sometimes he also read, wrote about Thanatos, which is the death force, because he had to explain not only sort of the life force or love, or that which drives us to connect with one another and be good, but why is it that we do kooky, crazy, aggressive, annihilative things? You know, if you study history, you'll appreciate that humans are very violent. Um, where does this come from? And so that was his force of Thanatos, or his death force, to, to explain aggressive behavior. And Freud really believed that we have all of this energy and we need to channel it. We need, and so socialization, civilization's job is to help people take their energy and focus it towards something healthy and good rather than have it spill out all over in destructive fashions. His model is very hedonistic. And hedonism is the idea that we are all driven towards what feels good. So if we're all driven to what feels good, sometimes that may be a pro-social thing, but sometimes that may be a very unsocial or anti-social thing. So it's civilizing forces, it's the pressure of others, the conformity of society, which leads us to not only do purely hedonistic things, such as, I want what you have, so I steal it, or gosh, I really like donuts and chocolate ice cream, so I think that all I'll do is eat donuts and chocolate ice cream for my whole life, Well, my life may be very short, because of all of the bad things I do to my body, living on a diet of donuts and chocolate ice cream. But hedonism would say, you know, a spinach salad just doesn't taste as good as a dozen donuts, so why don't you run to popular and buy them? Anyway, our id drives us. It's our energy. It's the part of us that says, cool, I want to do that. Yes, let's do that. Yes, this looks good. And it's not very mature, and it's not very sophisticated. It's what we're born with. Babies are born and they pretty much have a response that they don't feel good and they cry. And hopefully mom or dad or whoever is taking care of them can figure out what's going on. But babies are pure in. Now as we go through the oral phase and into the anal phase, we start to develop this thing called an ego. An ego in Freudian terms refers to a sense of reality. A sense that if I'm a baby and I have a need and I cry, sometimes mom or someone else will meet that need. Sometimes the world kind of constrains to that doesn't happen. But you start to learn little by little, crying when mom is in the room may be more effective than crying when you don't see anyone around. Why bother? It doesn't do any good anyway. So this is sort of our reality check. 
The ego is in touch with the real world. It appreciates that there are some constraints on our id, such as if I do this, my parents will be unhappy. If I do that, my parents will be thrilled. And so we can kind of start to make choices based on the reality of the world. Now, as we go through the phallic phase and we go through this edible complex, we begin to develop, assuming that we navigate the phallic phase well, we begin to develop what's called a superego. Your superego is your conscience. The conscience is what, according to Jiminy Cricket and Pinocchio, that still small voice inside of your head that what tells you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. I forgot the last, the last piece of the famous Jiminy Cricket's quote. But nonetheless, it's the part of your head that says, that wouldn't be right. That wouldn't be just. That wouldn't be fair. That wouldn't be good. So whereas the ego says, you know, smoking dope is a dumb thing to do because you might get caught, because it's illegal, and because if you're stoned and you try driving your car home, you might have a wreck and your parents would get mad at you and, you know, you might never be able to drive again. So it's just dumb. And that's what your ego tells you because that's reality. The super ego is the more morality part of you that may say, you know, Getting stoned is a bad idea because God wants me to treat my body better than that. So that would be a sort of church or religion driven super ego. You may say, oh, I'll disappoint my parents. I know they really want better for me, so I think I'll just say no to drugs. That would also be sort of a super ego driven. So it's more of the moral, the conscience, rather than just the reality, oh, I might get caught. If you look at Kohlberg's stage of moral development, this is a lower stage than this. This is a higher stage of morality. So it's your conscience. Now the ego spends a lot of its life sort of as a go-between. The id says, yes, I want to do that. And the superego says, eh, that would really, it's just not good. That's not right. It's not fair. It, it would hurt somebody's feelings. And the ego says, oh, do I listen to the id? Oh, do I listen to the superego? Do I check reality? What do I do? And so it kind of mediates between the real world, between the desires of the id, and between the sort of forces of the superego, which are kind of always trying to keep people in control. Now, obviously, different people have different levels of each of these. And all of us probably know some people who are very in them. People who are kind of free spirits. They do what they want. They have a lot of fun. They may not necessarily be the pillars of society, but you look at them on some days and you say, wow, I wish I could live my life more like that. Wish I could be freer of just always worrying about other people and fretting and stuff. Now we look at people who are very super ego driven and we may say, I wish I could be as good as they are. I have some friends who are just so good. And we sort of talk about this family as being like space aliens because they always make the moral and the right and the just decisions of everything. Ah, to be that good. But then, you know, it's kind of like, well, this is a sense of unencumbered fun, and this is sometimes so good that if you ever eat chocolate ice cream or donuts, or you always just have spinach for dessert, the ego kind of makes those choices for us, and each of us are different, and each of us will come up with different choices. So that's kind of how these stages go into the development of, of these and, and happy person. Now, one last thing that Freud really spent some time talking about is how we protect ourselves from sort of the inner turmoil of life. And to put back a small version, if we've got our iceberg here again with our conscious and our unconscious, there's a lot of stuff going on in the unconscious that, that is uncomfortable and that's painful and that we want to protect ourselves from. We do this, and there's a lot of stuff going on in the world that may, we may want to protect ourselves from. We do this through our, our creation of psychological defenses. A psychological defense is a sort of theoretical construct that we create which protects us from sort of the reality or the turmoil within and kind of keeps us functioning without facing the pain or the fear or the misery 
or some of, let's say, you have a child who's been horribly beaten, abused, molested as a child, and this is all there in the unconscious. If you look at that continually, hour after hour, day after day, you just won't survive. So you need some way to stuff it down and not pay attention. Those are the defenses, and the text has a bunch of them. I'll just go over a, briefly a few. Freud's classic defense is this idea of repression. Repression is the unconscious sort of deletion from your memory banks of something which is painful. So it's not choosing, I don't want to think about that. If you choose, I don't want to think about that. You know, finals are coming up, and you could get started studying now, but I don't want to think about that. Oh, this huge medical bill is due. I'll worry about that later. Oh, you know, I really need to look into buying a new car because my car is just going to croak any minute now. I just don't want to deal with that today. Those are called denial. Denial is a conscious choosing not to look at something right now because we don't want to. But it doesn't work as well as depression, as repression because it's sort of conscious. Repression is the actual forgetting. It's the person who was molested as a child who has no recollection of that. Perhaps forever, or oftentimes what we see in therapy, until maybe the molester is arrested and it goes on the front page of the newspaper, or if the molester was you know, dad or uncle or something like that, they die and all these memories come bursting forth or something. So sometimes things which were repressed stop being repressed of their own accord. Um, but this is an unconscious forgetting of stuff. This is a conscious choosing not to look at stuff. There are, you know, there is suppression and there's reaction formation. There is a healthy defense is seen, or sublimation is seen as being a healthy defense. Sublimation is when you take sort of undesirable impulses and you focus them in a healthy channel, such that if you tend to like continually eating ice cream, as I keep joking about in classes, you could become a taster for Tillamook or a taster for Ben and Jerry's. It would be a way to, instead of sit around and just, you know, spend all of your money on ice cream, to use your desire to eat ice cream for something which is healthy. If you absolutely love, um, <clears throat> you love guns, but you're worried that loving guns and liking to be around firearms might lead to trouble if you didn't have a healthy channel, perhaps you'd become a police officer or join the military. And as long as you sublimated things well, that could be a great career choice to take this love of guns and rather than use it in an aggressive fashion, to use it in a somewhat healthy fashion. So anyway, these are just a couple. The text goes over many more and, and read them and sort of get an understanding. Defenses are not by themselves good things or bad things. Defenses are necessary for survival. A lot of people get the idea that defenses are bad and we want to make them go away in our work with clients. But that's not really true. Defenses are necessary. They're there because we need protection. You know, the United States needs some defense against invasion, against terrorism, and so forth. It's just how you use those defenses so that repressing something may help keep people alive, may help keep people from becoming psychotic. But when it gets in the way of your functioning, it's not good. Denial at times can be helpful. You know, you just don't want to deal with it now. But if you never deal with the bills, pretty soon you're going to be living on the street with no telephone, no electricity, um, only the clothes on your back. So it works for a while, but then it stops working and comes back to bite you. So in therapy, what you try to do is help people understand their defenses. And again, instead of having your defenses work unconsciously, just willy-nilly, you try to help people be aware and try to have defenses work in people's favor instead of sort of coming back to bite them. So finally, what do you do with all this? What, is a, what does a psychoanalysis look like? Well, first of all, most people have seen movies of psychoanalysis, and the, the kind of caricature in which you see in psychoanalysis is the person lying down on a lovely Victorian couch, battling onwards and onwards and onwards, doing this thing called the free association, just talking whatever comes to your mind, say everything that comes to your mind with no um, editing out. And a therapist sitting in a high-backed chair that you can't see because there's a whole back of the chair staring out the window, hopefully awake, but perhaps, and I've heard stories of um, colleagues older than myself who went through analysis of them going around to look at their therapist and finding them sleeping. You pay a lot of money for 
for somebody to sleep, or that's a well-paid nap that, that that therapist has. But nonetheless, the awake therapist is sitting there in their chair and going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. tell me more about that, in a good German accent with a little mustache or something like that. So that's the caricature of psychoanalysis. Well, what does it all mean? First of all, in the therapy, the goal of psychoanalysis is to help bring the unconscious into conscious so that people have choices. It's to help people gain insight, which is awareness. It's an understanding of why I do what it is I do. It's an understanding of who I am as a person. So that people then can be free. They have this unconscious energy, which is all bound up, loosened up, and they can use it, and they can use it in a healthy fashion. So the way this works is, first of all, it starts with this idea of free association. The client goes into the therapist, and the therapist does have them assume the couch. The purpose for the couch is twofold. One, if you sit and you stare eyeball to eyeball at a therapist, it's very likely that that therapist is going to give you some feedback based on their face. So if you're looking at me, and I'm sitting here, and I'm listening, and I'm smiling, you might think, oh, she likes what I'm saying, so I'll keep saying more. But if I start, doing that, you might think I'm bored and switch topic. If I go up, you might think you've shocked me, and that might influence your behavior. So if you're lying on a couch and I'm sitting in a chair like this, you don't see me, you don't get any feedback, and that helps you to free associate, because free association is say anything and everything that comes to your mind without editing. So it's easier not to edit if you don't have the facial feedback of the therapist. The other reason to have people lie on a couch is it's seen as being a more regressive position. Regressive is it takes you back to a younger age. You feel more open, more vulnerable, and more childlike lying down and sitting up in a sort of business-like face-to-face conversation with another adult. And the purpose of free association is to get you back in touch with some of that early stuff, with things that you may have otherwise you choose not to say it because it's embarrassing or it's silly or it's trivial. If you're lying down and it frees you up, it regresses you, you hopefully can free associate better. Free association is seen as one of the ways that you get in touch with this unconscious material. Now, as people free associate, you some of the, the things which people which analysts talk about will get you in touch with the unconscious. An area of content is dreams. Freud called dreams the royal road to the unconscious. This is the way that you can kind of see what people's unconscious is doing, where as we dream, we don't have this conscious overlay. We just dream. And so you talk about your dreams. And supposedly unconscious wishes, desires, thoughts, feelings will show up in dreams. Slips of the tongue. This is when you say something that you didn't really think you meant to say, but it kind of turns out you really did mean it. So when something accidentally falls out of your mouth, so you meant to say something like, gosh, I just love statistics. And you say, God, you know, you're talking to me, the statistics professor. Gosh, I love statistics. You say, gosh, I love statistics. <gasps> oh, I didn't mean to say that. Well, sadistic means like, you know, cruel and awful. That may be how you really feel about statistics. But you said sadistics. That would be a lovely Freudian slip of the tongue, which would allow me to see what you really think about the boss. Um, Nonverbal behavior is also telling of what's going on unconsciously. However, the therapist isn't going to catch as much of it if he or she is sitting in a chair looking out the window and you're lying down on the couch. But how we respond nonverbally, and I've done psychodynamic work with clients, and they're sitting there, I'll look at when they look at me, when they look away, when their eyes sort of wander, when they look tense, and all that stuff gives you information. So if someone is saying, ah, da, 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 but they're looking very tense, it gives you an idea that maybe what they're saying isn't really how they're feeling. And the, the incongruity there, then you can kind of talk about and you can interpret. Interpretation is when the therapist makes a connection, a connection between something perhaps that you're saying and doing in your current life and where that may have developed back when you were a kid. So I wonder if, you know, the reason that you're attracted to alcoholic men is because your dad drank heavily through your whole childhood. 
You know, that doesn't seem like a very big aha experience. Um, but nonetheless, that would be an interpretation, and there are many more subtle interpretations. But you try to draw connections between either the client's behavior and what they're saying, um, and their current experiences, or their current experiences and their past experiences. This is driven by the therapist, which hopefully leads to insight on the part of the client. Insight is, wow, I never thought of it that way. You're so right. We've all had insights in our life, but it's kind of like that, and in a, a great insight is this wonderful epiphany, this aha experience, where you suddenly realize that the reason you may be doing this kooky thing today might be related to that that happened you know, yesterday or two months ago or 12 years ago or back when you were six years old. So that's what insight is. The goal of insight is, of course, that it leads you to have awareness and then, again, it pulls the unconscious into the conscious and you're more free to make changes. And let's also look at what's resistance. Resistance is that if everything in the unconscious could just be freed up, we wouldn't need therapy. We would just do it. So there's a reason that we're protecting ourselves. There's a reason our defenses are there creating this wall. And when the therapist starts getting too close, clients will start consciously or more often unconsciously doing things to protect themselves from this stuff coming out. So resistance shows itself in a variety of ways if the therapist asks a question, you know, I really don't know. I forget. Forgetting can be a resistance. If the client suddenly starts showing up, you know, a client who is always there punctually, comes in five minutes late one day, forgets the appointment the next week, has a doctor's appointment the following week, <coughs> <clears throat> the next week the car breaks down, this is interpreted as resistance. Things the client is doing to protect themselves from becoming aware of something in their unconscious which is uncomfortable for them. Um, so each of those are some of the components <coughs> of doing this therapy. Now a huge piece of psychoanalysis which is different in psychoanalysis than many of the other therapy, therapies and certainly than any that are outside of the psychodynamic realm, is this idea of transference. Transference is there's the relationship between the therapist and the client, which is really tried to be kept at a minimum. So one of the things that a good analyst will do is to keep their office as neutral and themselves as neutral and bland as possible. You don't put pictures of your family. You don't put pictures of your favorite activities and collectibles from all of your trips and hobbies. Keep it a neutral office. You kind of dress in a neutral fashion. You want to be a blank slate. You want to be someone that really is a non-person. And sitting in a chair where you don't have eye, -to eye contact and you're not really making a lot of commentary also helps you be sort of a non-person. The goal of this is so that the client can transfer Transferring is the client takes impulses, thoughts, feelings that they have toward some other important person in their life, mom and dad being usually the two first ones that would come to mind, and projecting them onto the therapist. And the theory is that it's much easier to project daddy characteristics onto a therapist if the therapist is kind of a non-person then if the therapist comes in and tells you all about their hiking trip and you know has all of this stuff in their office and all these photographs and all these cool collectibles, then if that was nothing like your dad, it's harder to think that the clients that the therapist is kind of taking on dad-like qualities. But if the therapist is sort of a non-person and you have dad issues, ideally this thing called a transference starts to develop where you relate to the therapist as if the therapist were dad and you start seeing dad in the therapist. Now, the therapist really isn't dad and may not be working like that, but the idea is your unconscious is projecting this stuff, it's taking this stuff out of you and throwing it onto the therapist. Now, the cool thing about this is that if you take all these daddy issues and you throw them on the therapist, you can then work through them. You can talk with the therapist in a fashion that you maybe couldn't talk with dad about these issues you have with them. Maybe dad has died. Maybe dad isn't willing to talk with you. Maybe dad's crazy as a loon. But the therapist supposedly is a fairly healthy person and can process with you these feelings you have towards dad. And that's the working through. It's the taking, it's talking about sort of the issues of transference, taking the insight you've gained through interpretations and processing them and then using them to actually make behavioral changes in the way you
you think about yourself, the way you relate to others, the way you interact with the world. And kind of to bring about this general overall personality change. But this idea of transference is huge in psychoanalysis. It's huge and it's big in all of the psychodynamic therapies. It's more unique to them. Most of the other models have moved away from it and talk about the relationship, but they don't really try to foster and create a transference, even though there's sort of some of that there, and we'll talk about that to some extent in those theories. But it's a very key component of psychoanalysis. And for those of you who are fuzzy and nebulous about this, this would probably be a good thing to have either a Blackboard discussion about or to email me about or something so that we can go over it because it really is a kind of critical component and yet at the same time is, is fairly nebulous and, and hard to understand in a world where we generally don't work on this in, in modern day therapies. But that's kind of how Freud put all of this stuff together to work with people. It was a, psychoanalysis is seen as being a lengthy process. People would come three times a week, four times a week, they'd lie on the couch for an hour and they come back week after week and in many places psychoanalysis will go on for years. So it is time consuming, it is expensive, it does not work well with people who are seriously disturbed, so with psychosis, with serious personality problems, with people who are fragile, suicidal, um, dissociating, it's very, very risky because imagine lying on a couch free associating about your stuff for three or four hours a week if your stuff down there in the unconscious is very, very scary. You don't want to take a fragile person through a really intense procedure like this. Today, it's not very widely practiced because it is time consuming and because it's expensive and because pretty much managed care and health insurance plans aren't going to pay for it. You pay out of pocket. It's 125 a pop. You're talking 500 bucks potentially a week. Most people can't lay that out for a year or two or three years. But the goal is sort of overall personality overhaul and sort of becoming a changed person who's much more self-knowledgeable, self-aware, and freer of all of this heavy, weighty stuff because it's now in your pre-conscious or your conscious. Anyway, that is it for Freud.